In this video, we're gonna imagine if every rejected fighter in Smash history actually got into the game. Why did these characters get cut? Who would they have replaced if they got in? And did Nintendo make the right or wrong calls here? Would we actually have been better off with the scrapped character in comparison to what we got? At the end, we're gonna see the complete roster had every rejected fighter gotten in and the major ripple effect there would have been because of these decisions. The first character, or characters I should say I want to talk about, are Toon Zelda and Sheik, undoubtedly one of the game's most interesting rejected characters slots. We could tell they were cut sometime during the development of the series' third entry, Super Smash Bros. Brawl, based on a file name found in the game's data for a character called, quote, Toon Zelda slash Sheik, which kind of interestingly was the first entry in the series that added Toon Link, who was effectively the replacement for Young Link who got cut from Super Smash Bros. Melee, which I totally understand. It made a lot more sense from Nintendo's perspective to add a character who could promote a whole slew of Zelda games in a particular art style, instead of really just Ocarina of Time in Majora's Mask for the most part. But what if Toon Link wasn't the only character planned to be in this style? What if we got a Toon Zelda as well? This is something that a lot of the fan base has sunk their teeth into examining the what if scenarios, so let's break it down. But first, um, Toon Cheek? doesn't exist. There's been no iteration of the character in that art style, so would this have been a Smash original character then? Well, this almost certainly would not have been the case. It's almost a certainty that Tetra would have been this character as she was basically designed to have been Wind Waker Sheik, potentially providing a different moveset style to Sheik, which could have been kind of cool, and also probably a burden on Brawl's development since reportedly back then there were major setbacks during the devising of Brawl, which almost certainly led to this character being cut, probably a little bit too ambitious. And while I praise the inclusion of Toon Link as a replacement, I would been much more on board if he couldn't be included because these two joining the battle instead I think would have been so much better, particularly because of the uniqueness in the character swapping mechanic, but also in the playstyle of Tetra. I don't think the discussion ever would have been to replace Zelda and Sheik with the Toon version of the characters, because then why wouldn't they have just brought back Young Link if the Toon reference was already planned to be given out, right? You don't desperately need two characters in the Toon style. If this duo actually got in, I think there could have been a very interesting lasting impact, as if they had to split them up in Smash 4 like they did with regular Zelda and Sheik, and left them in their solo forms going forward, we could have ended up having an ultimate three forms of Link, two forms of Zelda, two Sheik-styled characters, and a version of Ganondorf who started out as a clone of Captain Falcon in his own right, just further establishing how ridiculous the Zelda situation is in Smash. Although I suppose in an ideal world, we would have gotten one of the pairs split up and one kept together, because that way you appeal to pretty much everyone. The crowd that liked playing the two together in Brawl and Melee could use Toon Zelda and Tetra, those who liked just playing Zelda could choose her, and those who just wanted to play as Sheik could play as Sheik. Really just checking all the boxes here, and because of all these scenarios, I've gotta say that this duo was one of my favorite rejected characters of all time, and that's saying something because they're really only half original here. A bunch of the other characters that we're going to cover today are completely original, so we're going to chalk one on the board for them making the wrong call here, and we're going to see by the end of this video how many rights or wrong calls they would have made, in, in my opinion at least. Now while Toon Zelda and Cheek were a couple of my favorite rejected characters, they were from Brawl, and there were actually many characters rejected before this. So for the rest of this video, let's try to go in chronological order. Let's start with the rejected characters from Super Smash Bros. Melee. Why not Smash 64? Well, it kind of seems like every rejected full-on character slot from Smash 64 actually ended up getting into Smash sometime in the future. Martha was supposed to be in and got in the future, Bowser was supposed to be in, I believe Mewtwo was supposed to be in as well, all these guys ended up getting in, but that's not the case for Takamaru in Super Smash Bros. Melee. Takamaru is a character from the NES and Famicom title The Mysterious Murazame Castle, and in the game you go about this castle with your sword slicing and dicing the enemies trying to clear the areas. It's a genre that's been replicated numerous times since its inception, and according to Sakurai, he was indeed considered to join the roster of Super Smash Bros. Melee, but said his chances were low due to his lack of relevancy. And well, they certainly must have been pretty low, as he said, because Takamaro never ended up joining the battle. In the mysterious Murazame castle, Takamaro attacks enemies physically, so it's safe to say that he'd probably be an exclusively melee fighter in the vein of Marth, a pretty quick and up-close playstyle. And while some characters who weren't overly relevant have been carried by their unique playstyle to get a spot in the Smash Bros. roster, Takamaro's playstyle didn't seem to completely justify it for it's hard to gauge how relevant he really was, but I'd say it was probably in a similar vein to the Ice Climbers before they got into Smash, or just a straight up retro rep likely wouldn't have made him the hugest priority to add. If he was actually in Melee though, they likely would have had him take Roy's spot due to the Marth similarity as I mentioned, and Roy being fairly irrelevant outside of Japan at the time, since the game that would go on to feature him hadn't yet released at the time of Melee. I honestly go either way in terms of if I would have preferred them to take a shot and add Takamaru here. Weighing against Takamaru is Roy's fun playstyle and the fact that not many 
people know who he is, but weighing for him is the irrelevancy of Roy outside of Smash, the fact that Fire Emblem already is bloated as a series character-wise, the fact that Takamaro being in Smash could have potentially led to a revival of the franchise like Pit's inclusion for Kid Icarus, as well as the fact that the playstyle would have likely been very similar, so it's not like we're losing much here anyway. And because of this, I'm going with them once again making the wrong call here if this was a decision that they weighed, although there's no confirmation of this. But even though Takamaro got rejected here, this may not be the last that we see of him. We're gonna come back to him later on. Another rejected fighter from the roster of Melee was Mock Rider, and this is one who was brought up within the past couple of years, so you may recognize this name. For those who don't know, Mock Rider was a conventional 2D racing game released for the NES in 1985. It often gets confused with Excite Bike, which we're gonna talk about in a second, but the games were much different, with Mock Rider giving you the perspective behind the rider, whereas in Excite Bike, you get to see the perspective of all the riders traveling in a 2D plane. Despite their differences though, both apparently had representatives considered for the roster of Super Smash Bros. Melee. And for Mock Rider in particular, he wasn't likely considered too deeply for a playable role, although Sakurai has mentioned him in interviews, stating that he thought Mock Rider had a cool sounding name. Mock. This would have likely just gone down as a small blip in the long history of Sakurai interviews, which likely would have been an even smaller blip had Mock Rider's eligibility for Smash not been brought up in more recent years. In the later part of mid-2018, at the height of the build-up to Smash Ultimate's release, we received one of the most popular leaks of all time, this being the Grinch leak. Although unlike the video where we covered every real leak in Smash history, this leak was not legit, although it still included Mock Rider. And despite this character's lack of relevancy, there had not been many many retro characters revealed for Smash Ultimate at this time, so many viewed Mock Rider as a realistic representative here. To some, this guy being here added a little bit of credibility to the leak, myself included. It got his name out there again, but when the game's base roster was finally shown, and then we subsequently got every DLC character finally revealed, showing that Mock Rider was nowhere to be found, this leak was proven to be completely false. So it was likely proven accurate that this consideration to be in the roster of Super Smash Bros. Melee was probably the only time he was ever considered to be playable in Smash history, and was likely rejected due to the lack of relevancy at the time if he was even seriously considered at all. But I mentioned Excite Bike, and he was another character who was apparently considered in a joking manner, although potentially more of a serious vein compared to Mock Rider. As Sakurai is quoted in interviews as saying that they would have needed to add ramps for Excite Bike to jump on to make it a realistic moveset and implementation into Smash Brothers, which likely wasn't very feasible at the time of Melee's release, although since then they have added more complicated mechanics like Ink for Inkling, which was likely not the easiest mechanic to include either. So if this was the only reason why he was rejected, then it doesn't fully explain why he's not in Smash today. But bottom line for Mock Rider and Excite Bike is that both of these characters being rejected with only one of them having been given a slight official reasoning gives some slight hope that maybe they'll make it in as a retro representative in the future. With Excite Bike being much more likely in my opinion if they figure out the moveset since Nintendo has been pretty keen on referencing it in recent years, with it being included in the Switch Online service and getting a complete track from Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Whereas Mock Rider, if he was truly cut due to lack of popularity back during the development of Melee, it's certainly not going to help his cause now being 20 years after that. At the time, both would have been retro representatives and likely would have taken the place of another with a unique moveset if they ended up actually getting into the game, since I don't see these characters being clones of any other too easily. Especially Excite Bike, since they mentioned the development perils that they'd be put through. So we're really only left with Ice Climbers or Game & Watch to replace if we had to swap out a character, and I really don't prefer either one. Game & Watch is much more iconic than either of these two, and while the Ice Climbers are definitely not more well known than Excite Bike, at least just regarding Smash, the mechanic of having two characters fighting at once is still really innovative despite the simple movesets. And while it's arguable, I'd say they made the right call here in both situations. So now we're kind of tied up in the tally 2-2. We're going to see how this plays out going forward, and it's going to be really interesting to see the complete roster at the end of the video to see just how right or wrong Nintendo and the team may have been here. Another interesting rejected character was Ayumi Tachibana from Famicom Detective Club, a duo of adventure games for the Famicom disc system in Japan, but not for anywhere else. And Sakurai himself has stated that he was, quote, a big fan of the games and was thinking about including them during the Melee days, Ayumi even has her own trophy in the game in the end, there's no way she would work overseas. So they ultimately couldn't include her. So even though she got rejected from Melee, there's an interesting piece to the story. If you fast forward to today, things have kind of changed in the regard of her being regionally restricted. As funnily enough, in 2021, we actually saw an international release of these two games for the first time remade on the Nintendo Switch. The character is still not overly relevant or anything, but at least the Japan-only argument cannot be made there as much anymore. If she actually got into Smash, we could have expected attacks from her accessories in the game like the magnifying 
magnifying glass, briefcase, rope and the like. A bit more of a unique moveset and due to this, I really don't know who she would have replaced when getting in. You could say Roy since he was the closest thing to a Japan exclusive character in Melee, but he was also a clone as we just went over, so that definitely doesn't qualify. Maybe a retro character then? And if that's the case, it's difficult to say that replacing someone like Game & Watch would have been a good call considering that both seem to be unique characters and Game & Watch is clearly a more important reference to have. So overall, it was probably for the best that Ayumi missed the cut, but still an interesting rejected character regardless. Someone else who was rejected from the roster of Melee was Balloon Fighter from, well, the NES game Balloon Fighter. This is a game where you float around on balloons shooting things around you and he was rejected for it not really making sense for the character to be fighting after his balloons are popped since that's how you die in the game. Would obviously once again be a retro representative and was said to be up for the Ice Climber spot in a similar vein to Excitebike and Mock Rider, but this time I'm really adamant in hindsight that I wouldn't have wanted Balloon Fighter to be included due to the main gimmick of the fighter eventually being given to Villager in Smash 4. Villager being another character in a similar vein to Toon Zelda slash Sheik who was considered for Super Smash Bros. Brawl but was eventually scrapped, this time due to there not being too much of a fighter concept being foreseen for the Animal Crossing protagonist, but when the series was recognized as too popular to exclude by the time Smash 4 came out, their hand was effectively forced and they had to draw moves from somewhere, so they took the main gimmick of Balloon Fighter. And since this has sort of led this guy's gimmick to living on, and this reference is still in there in Smash, probably forever, it's safe to say that we got the best of both worlds here. We got a Balloon Fighter reference while also getting a unique character in instead of one who was completely literally one-dimensional. Another rejected fighter from Melee was Urban Champion. This is the protagonist of the NES two-player 2D fighting game of the same name, and the fighter from there was initially considered as a retro rep for the roster of Melee by Sakurai since, well, on the surface, who's more fitting for a 2D platform fighter than one of the pioneers of the genre for Nintendo at least, right? But due to the simplistic design of Urban Champion's gameplay, it was seen that the character wouldn't have too many interesting moves to use and was eventually rejected from the roster because of that. I'm pretty glad they excluded him since after examining his moveset potential since he'd likely be an entirely melee based fighter, I mean pretty fitting for the time I guess, but with just some mixes of strong and weak punches being included here, we're really looking at a less interesting Little Mac at best, which makes it difficult for me to believe that he was said to be up for the Ice Climber spot again as it seems like he would have been much easier to create in theory. I'd say it would be more likely that he would have replaced Ganondorf who would have made a lot more sense to me since he's the closest thing to an up close new fighter introduced for melee, this making Urban Champion the new Captain Falcon clone, and there would have been some benefits to Ganondorf not being included in the roster melee likely because he wouldn't have been based on Captain Falcon for no reason. He could have potentially been included in a more unique vein later down the line, but I still don't think it was worth it taking the risk here, especially for a character as irrelevant at the time as Urban Champion was, and they have been tweaking Ganon bit by bit over the years as well, particularly in Ultimate with the sword. The final character who was said to be up for Ice Climber spot in melee was Bubbles from the NES title, Cuckoo Land. This is an arcade title that released on the NES where you play as this bubble and travel through the maze trying to find all the gold that's been stolen by an evil sea urchin. <laughs> Nintendo stories haven't changed too much over the years, huh? The obvious issue that comes from including a character as simple as this one is what kind of moveset would you give to them? And this is a question that Sakurai and the team simply could not answer. With no moveset ideas at the forefront for Bubbles, this fighter concept simply had to be cut. Needless to say, if Bubbles actually replaced the Ice Climbers like they were rumored to do, I certainly would not have been happy. If they ever found a way to make it work as a unique joke character in the future, I'd be intrigued, but there's so many more iconic characters who could be put into that spot that I don't even really know if it's worth it at this point. And while this was the final melee character rejected for Ice Climber's spot, there is one who might not have been put in anybody's spot. A spot of his own, one of the most unique rejected characters in Smash history, has to be James Bond. While the 007 film franchise has taken on a massive life of its own over the years, we shouldn't forget that this fictional character was in the GoldenEye universe, GoldenEye being one of the classic Nintendo 64 titles held in high regard by longtime Nintendo fans throughout history. Boomers, basically. But as one would expect when dealing with a character with the amount of appearances and rights holders as him, there would certainly be some issues arising following the thought of adding him into Smash. Sakurai stated in interviews that they couldn't include him in the roster of Melee due to licensing issues with his live actor Pierce Bronston's likeness, his real realistic weaponry possibly being too much for the game's age rating, the film rights for the character, and the N64 game rights all compounding together to create a mountain too large for the development team to scale over. Now if James Bond actually got into Smash, this would have certainly opened up a ton of possibilities for the future, maybe more than almost any other character out there. While we have the quote unquote rule now that no non-video game original characters can join the battle, having someone like James Bond in Smash Brothers could have busted the door clean open and Smash would undoubtedly look much different today. Definitely would have caused one of the biggest ripple effects throughout the years, who knows who could have followed him. And while I like the video game nature of Smash right now and opening it up to other types of characters who appear in a greater capacity outside of the gaming bubble may be controversial to some, and while I am apprehensive myself, don't get me wrong, I think if the door was open, the advent of reveal trailers would be
be made it that much better because the who's it going to be mantra could have so much more of an impact now. Suffice to say that James Bond is definitely going to be one of the biggest standouts on the final roster when we take a look at the end of the video if every rejected character actually got into the Smash roster and what that would look like. And now we're back where we started this video in the roster of Super Smash Brothers Brawl. Who was the first character apparently considered to join the battle that ended up getting rejected and never seen again? Well, this would be the Nintendog. Yeah. An interesting piece of Super Smash Bros. Brawl trivia to me is that Villager, Nintendogs, and the Miis were all considered for the roster of the game, and Sakurai thought that they were not meant to be fighting characters. I already mentioned Villager, and online bullying was said to be the issue for the Miis, but both the Miis and Villager would go on to debut in Smash 4 regardless. However, the Nintendogs would remain as assist trophies. Now, some of you actually may not be too familiar with Nintendogs if you weren't playing games during the DS era, considering that this game only had massive popularity around that time. And when I'm saying massive, I mean massive. If you owned a DS, you almost certainly owned at least one of New Super Mario Bros. or Nintendogs as they were the two best-selling games in the history of the console, massive sales numbers. Which would, in most cases, lead to a Smash implementation, right? And while it did for some, Nintendogs were not included in that bunch. And why was this? Well, even though they didn't seem to have realistic moveset possibilities for the roster of Brawl, by the time Smash 4 came around, they included the other two as I mentioned, this series wasn't doing as hot. The sequels to Nintendogs were just not able to sustain the initial interest of the first game. The concept of owning a virtual pet on your DS was novel at the time, and a really good game to pair the console with for someone who wasn't really into video games, were just trying to get acquainted with the console's features, but after one experience with it, what's really left for there to do? Add more types of dogs? Cats? things to do? We talk about a lot of franchises like Call of Duty or Pokemon getting recycled over and over with the same core formula, but at least there's a little bit of depth and replayability there. Nintendogs? Not so much. There hasn't been a new one since the 3DS, despite the concept possibly working well for both the Wii U and the Switch. And due to this lack of modern relevancy and the perceived lack of moveset potential during the series' heightened popularity, we likely shouldn't ever expect one to join Smash, unless some random revival of the series happens with something unique being added in that could eventually be used in a platform fighter. If they actually did get into the roster of Brawl, though I could have seen him replacing someone like Rob since he's the closest thing to a general quote-unquote Nintendo rep than anyone else. Our next rejected character is Blastoise. Pokemon Trainer's team was originally going to be a bit different during the development process of Brawl, as this guy was actually considered to be part of the three, but was ultimately replaced by Squirtle, the first Pokemon in its evolutionary line, and there's a couple reasons for this. On the surface, it seems better to have three Pokemon of varying sizes, types, and stages of their evolutionary lines to work very well in Smash. As a character concept and just looking at the Pokemon trainer aesthetically, having Blastoise, Charizard, and Ivysaur, a middle stage to go with those two finals, it looks kind of weird in comparison. Unless they plan on having Venusaur instead of Ivysaur, despite there being no evidence of that, and even if they did, the evolution mechanics wouldn't be present, so I feel we'd be worse off. But this was not the entire reason. Sakurai felt Squirtle could, quote, establish itself better as a character than Blastoise. When I covered this situation in a previous video, I noted that this would mainly have to do with the moveset potential and fitting in amongst the others in the cast. But what I've never really gone in depth on is why would this have been a problem for Blastoise anyway? A slow bruiser character who can shoot water cannons seems unique and interesting to me and we really don't have something like that in Smash yet. But maybe that's exactly the reason. Maybe Sakurai and the team don't like the idea of this type of playstyle. A big, powerful, slow character whose main gimmick is pushing the opponent away from you like Mario's Flood? So what are you going to do as a follow-up to that attack? You're likely going to be so slow that the opponent has probably landed and gotten a hold of themselves before he could even reach him. While it's likely not the biggest problem and the issue could have likely been remedied in many ways if they really wanted to add in Blastoise, but if Squirtle fit the trainer better for all the other reasons that we mentioned, why would they have had any urgency to add Blastoise in at all? In my opinion, we ended up with one of the best character concepts in the entire roster with the current Pokemon trainer without a doubt, so it's pretty easy to say they made the right call here. Although if they added Blue down the Line and really wanted to try out Blastoise again, I certainly wouldn't be disappointed. Now, during the development of Brawl, the team wanted to add another Star Fox character in, with Crystal being the original choice, which makes some sense. She was one of the main characters in Star Fox Adventures, which was a fairly recent title during the time of Brawl's development, and despite its controversial uniqueness from the established Star Fox formula at the time, it still managed to sell close to 2 million units, which was pretty good for the GameCube, and over double what the more traditional follow-up Star Fox title would go on to sell on the same console in 2005. Lots of people were starting to get from familiar with the character. Many of them uh, happen to be artists, 
if you weren't aware. She could have had a very unique moveset too, with her basic attacks focusing around the staff with magical abilities being usable from it, such as shooting fire or shooting warp portals, which could have been really cool. We could have been in store for a very unique rep here, but it didn't happen. Crystal ultimately had to be rejected due to time constraints during Brawl's development, as Wolf, who would end up being her replacement fighter, was much more close to the concept of Fox and Falco, who were already included in the roster of Melee. The argument pertaining to Crystal's popularity in the series didn't have much weight when Wolf was revealed to be the replacement. It'd be one thing if you were talking about a more obscure character, but Wolf being the main rival character in the series, he presented a natural foil to Fox in terms of a gameplay style, and yeah, him being significantly easier to create definitely didn't hurt either. It's a shame to me though, as I could have definitely foreseen an interesting moveset here, and I know Wolf is a fan favorite, super cool and all, and highly requested to return for Ultimate after being cut in the roster of Smash 4, I still would have much preferred for a unique addition to the roster in Crystal. She was eventually included as an assist trophy in Ultimate, which is a step in the right direction, maybe? It might not have been enough, though Star Fox has been in a terrible state recently, and while it wouldn't shock me at all to see them give the series one more shot on the Switch, if it flops once again, I'd be very doubtful that this rejected character ever becomes playable. And because of that, I'm definitely going to say they made the wrong call with this one. Gina was one of the most infamous rejected characters in Smash history without a doubt, and while I've covered parts of his story in videos through the past, this is the complete story of Gina. Why is this guy brought up so often in Smash Brothers discussions? He's literally appeared in one game, and I'm not trying to discredit him, he's a decently important and interesting character from there, but he's definitely not like the biggest video game icon ever. You want to talk sales numbers? I brought them up for Star Fox, so it'd only be fair to talk about it here too. This game only barely passed Adventures sales-wise, and this was on a console that sold over double the GameCube and has Super Mario on the cover of it, so make of that what you will. This guy should not be brought up as much as he is right? Well, that would be the case had he not been rejected from Smash multiple times. In the development process of Super Smash Bros. Brawl, he was considered to be a playable character due to Sakurai believing that he could have a very unique moveset with the gun hand from Mario RPG and all the magical attacks that he uses, transitioning perfectly into a Smash Bros. moveset in a stark contrast to many of the rejected characters that we've covered. Whereas those guys don't really have much potential for a Smash moveset, Gino does. His lack of relevancy shouldn't have really needed to matter if there's a bunch of other characters that are in for mainly retro purposes, right? Well, the issue likely came down to the legality of who owns the character. While Gino was in a Super Mario game, this game was developed by Square Enix and the character of Gino being an original creation for that game likely ended up being their property. And due to the relationship of Nintendo and Square not being what it is today at the time of Super Smash Bros. Brawl, it meant that even though Sakurai wanted it to happen, it couldn't. But if rights were really the only issue here, then why was Gino given a Mii outfit and not playable in Smash 4? We're gonna get into that once we move on to Smash 4, but before that, we're we're gonna finish out the Brawl characters with our next duo here being Plusle and Minin. This duo appear to have been rejected from Brawl as there are file names in the game for Pra and Mai, both being the first syllables of Plusle and Minin's Japanese names respectively. These are quite interesting omissions, which may seem kinda random thinking about it now, but I'm gonna try to explain why this makes a lot more sense than you may think, especially at the time. Brawl began development in late 2005, with Pokemon's fourth generation also being in development at that time, which likely led to the idea of bringing Lucario into the game to eventually promote Pokemon Diamond and Pearl when they released. But Gen 3 was actually out at this time, so even though it wouldn't be the most relevant in the two and a half years or so later that they figured it would take to develop Brawl, Plus and Minin were already in a Pokemon game. People knew who these characters were. Pokemon's third gen didn't sell as well as Gen's two or one before it, so who knows if that trend was going to continue. Maybe Lucario would have debuted in an even less popular game than these two did. It seems crazy saying it now with how well Diamond and Pearl did and we got the remakes and all that, but at this time, those thoughts had to be going through the heads of the Smash Brothers development team. So the idea was to develop this duo based on Pikachu, since they are literally Pikachu clones in the Pokemon game in which they appear, and this would sort of be combined with the Ice Climber concept of having two characters fight together, since they fight together in double battles in the game as well. Further credence to this can be added when examining that Brawl cut Pichu from Melee. These two were certainly intended to be the replacement, as this is exactly what happened with Mewtwo and Lucario. Lucario has a very similar aura charging mechanic to Mewtwo's ballistic object that he shoots, and some other similarities were seen, so he was clearly a replacement, and they were likely going to do the same thing here, but maybe ended up scrapping the idea due to the success of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, and the massive popularity Lucario would receive. So in this situation, I think the debate for Brawl's roster would have came down to having Plusle and Minin or Lucario. And while it certainly would have provided a unique character, I still don't know if I would have preferred this due to the ripple effect it would have caused. Considering Ultimate brought back every cut character from the past, we would have had Pikachu, Pichu, 
and the duo of Plusle and Mining, all with similar movesets, and I'd feel like such a hypocrite saying that this is okay while complaining about three links being in Smash all the time. It doesn't seem right. So if this was the choice, I'd say they made the right one here adding Lucario in. Even though the concept of having two Pokemon fight alongside one another is something I'd like to see sometime. Maybe not with two electric road in Pokemon like Plusle and Mining though. Now without a doubt, one of the most fascinating rejected characters from Brawl has to be Dixie Kong, as she actually wasn't intended to replace anybody, seemingly being planned to appear in a duo role with another character before eventually being cut. According to Sakurai, at one point there was a working prototype that featured a Dixie and Diddy Kong combo character which I think could have been the coolest thing ever. This would have called back to their tag team mechanics in Donkey Kong Country 2 where you could swap between one you controlled and the other would still follow you around and contribute with certain moves. This would have likely been a hybrid between the swapping of Zelda and Sheik with the duality of the Ice Climbers which I think would have been amazing and definitely a character concept that could have stood the test of time, still seeming unique and innovative today. The problem is something so innovative must have been oh so difficult to develop at the time, considering the limited window they had during the development of Brawl. They ended up having to just settle on having one of them in the game, and with Diddy being the more famous of the two, having his own game and everything, he was definitely the clear choice. This one is such a shame, although I do understand it. In terms of a ripple effect, if this actually happened, I don't think too much would look different for the Donkey Kong franchise in Smash right now. I don't see any reason for why K. Rool wouldn't get in because of this, although he probably would have gotten a Captain K. Rool alternate costume to reference Donkey Kong Country 2, as this is one where he actually fights in a duo. But other than that, not too much. And you know what? While a lot of the concepts and characters that we've covered today, I still don't think have a chance to make it in Smash in the future. If they ended up having to tone down the roster for a future Smash entry, lowering the amount of total characters as many would expect considering just how many Ultimate had, there is still a chance that they could modify Diddy to allow her to get in, still providing something new without as much effort as a completely original fighter. And why do I believe this? The reason is with the many Echo fighters included in Smash Ultimate and how easy it would have been in theory to tack on Dixie Kong to go along with K. Roll in a similar vein to how they threw Dark Samus in to go with Ridley, they chose not to. And maybe that was because they always envisioned this Diddy and Dixie concept, and making her a separate clone now would probably ruin the chance for that sometime in the future. If they didn't presently have the time to modify Diddy to add Dixie in, who knows if they may have that shot sometime down the road, right? And if so, I'd be all for it. I can see if you're a big Dixie Kong fan or whatever really wanting her to get her completely own unique spot, but the fact is that outside of the hair twirling mechanics, nothing makes too much sense to change from Diddy Kong, so we could either likely end up getting a standard run of the mill clone with that one alteration, or we can end up getting them both placed in this one slot, creating one of the best character concepts the series will likely ever see. And if that was the choice, I'm taking that one all day long. We finally move on now to Smash 4's rejected characters, and one of the first characters that we talked about in this video I've got to bring up again, this being Takamaru. We could argue about how relevant he was at the time of Melee all day long, but one thing that's for certain about his relevancy though is that when he was once again considered to be in the roster of Smash 4, trying to bring back an NES character like they did for Pit from Kid Icarus and Brawl, he was just seen as too irrelevant and too unrecognizable to join the battle, so an assist trophy role was given to the character instead. Hard to say who he would have replaced in this case, probably not Roy since he was only brought back as DLC specifically because he was at this point a character that fans knew and was easier to develop, so maybe Duck Hunt as the duo is sort of taking the NES role here for Smash 4, but considering how much more unique the Duck Hunt duo is compared to the moveset that we envisioned for Takamaru earlier, and it probably would have been a similar moveset for Smash 4 since there had been no new content for the mysterious Murzami Castle released by that time, I think we were much better off getting Duck Hunt here instead of this character. Even if the uniqueness of the characters doesn't put it over the top for you, if you want to talk icon status, Duck Hunt was frequently bundled with releases of Super Mario Bros. during the NES time period, so he was definitely much more iconic than a character from the mysterious Murzami Castle, a game which most people have never heard of. They undoubtedly made the right call with this one. A pretty interesting rejected character from Smash 4 is Hihachi from Tekken. With Bandai Namco having a hand in Smash 4's development, a character from there was on the table now more than ever, with the character who was probably the most obvious choice to include from them being Pac-Man. Without a doubt, one of the biggest video game icons of all time, maybe not in this form, but still popular nonetheless. So when Sakurai was asked if anyone else from Bandai Namco was under consideration for the roster, he initially said none only to elaborate further that there were some who were briefly considered, but not strongly, with the only specific name he would drop here being Hihachi. Being Tekken's most popular character, it's natural to bring him up at least for a period of time through the discussion process, but the reasoning for his omission seemingly wasn't just because Pac-Man was the obvious pick. Another reason was given by Sakurai when he stated that, quote, implementing Hihachi's movement in Smash would be difficult. It's complicated examining this modernly, trying to find out what he meant by this, because it had to have been a Hihachi issue specifically and not a Tekken one. His Kazuya 
would go on to be implemented into Smash Ultimate as DLC, coming from the same series and there were no movement issues there. Perhaps there was fear of the Tekken fanbase not being happy with the oversimplification that would have been required for including Hayachi's moves. That could have been a reason for omitting him, but it's definitely still possible that they only had time to develop one Bandai Namco character, they only had one slot available, and Pac-Man was just given that spot. This isn't going to be the last that we see of Hihachi though, we're going to talk more about him in a little bit. Another interesting rejected character from Smash 4 has to be a Rhythm Heaven representative as there's no interview confirmation of this, but we found out that there was one considered for the roster of the game due to files that were found in the game as well as leaks that were going on during the time period. Well according to the Gamatsu leak which I covered in a previous video that in short called almost every single character revealed in the first half of Smash 4's promotional cycle except for two inaccuracies being the calls of Krom and the Chorus Men from Rhythm Heaven. Krom was confirmed by Sakurai to have been scrapped during development of Smash 4 only to go on to appear as an Echo in Ultimate, so it stands to reason that the Chorus Kids were also considered before getting cut. Now on the surface, it seems like a rhythm based moveset could have been really interesting, maybe time your attacks to the music of the stage that you're fighting on. It would have been a nightmare to enforce in competitive, but for casual play, wow, that would have been so much fun. But somewhere along the way, an issue was found. Be it this rhythm concept not working too well on the minds of the team, them not being able to get all three characters functioning on the screen at the same time, time for the 3DS version of the game, this was proven to be an issue as the Ice Climbers had to be cut from Smash 4 for this exact reason, or maybe the priorities just shifted to a more relevant character instead. It probably would have ended up taking the spot of someone like Bowser Jr. who was also very unique and interesting, and if that was the case it didn't really make much sense, Jr. was on a much higher level of priority for Smash 4, apparently they really rushed to get him into the game since this was a Mario rep they desperately wanted to add, and with him being on this higher priority level it doesn't make sense to reference Rhythm Heaven here, even though you do get a new franchise in there, there's undoubtedly still a lot lot more people that would want to play as Bowser Jr. in Smash than a Rhythm Heaven character, this is how it is. Maybe Rosalina could have caused an issue with the Chorusman getting in as they probably didn't want to introduce multiple reps with the several characters gimmick thing, wouldn't have stopped them from including someone like Karate Joe instead, but I digress. Just throwing out theories here since Sakura hasn't provided anything concrete surrounding this issue. It's unknown whether these guys will join the battle sometime in the future, but the series hasn't really gotten any more popular since this time period, so we're kind of in a similar state. If there was technical issues though, hopefully as Nintendo's hardware continues to improve and improve going forward this won't be an issue any longer. Getting back to the Geno situation as we were discussing before, this guy would end up getting a Mii costume in Smash 4 which coincided with the DLC release of Cloud Strife. A major step forward for Nintendo and Square Enix's relationship to have the protagonist of Final Fantasy 7 included here, but things were still not as peachy as they are today. For starters, there were only two music tracks included in here, and not much other content outside of the character and stage included as DLC, a sign that Square was still being pretty stingy with their properties. But along with that, this was also downloadable content, and what many forget about Geno's Mii outfit is that that was DLC as well, releasing in late 2015. Since Smash 4's DLC was mainly focused around bringing back previously cut characters with a few brand new big heavy hitters, even if the rights were available to get Geno into a playable role at the time, it likely wasn't feasible to develop this character as DLC when others were either significantly easier to create with their moveset already being conceived, had big name value like Ryu or Cloud, or had marketing motives behind their decision to be included such as Corrin. Gino had none of these, and subsequently didn't get in as a fighter, he got in as a Mii outfit. And the unfortunate part for Gino in all of this is this may have been his last chance. I've covered this in a previous video about characters who may have completely missed their final shot to be in Smash, and at this point, I feel Gino has. The game's director wanted him in during the development of Brawl, but couldn't. He was considered for the roster of Smash 4, but had to be relegated to a Mii costume due to these extenuating circumstances. And now we've gone so many years later and an entire entry has passed us by that any relevancy that he did have at the time of those two games is almost all but faded away. And if this really was the director's passion project, the character that he really wanted to include, he definitely would have taken up one of the spots. He would have probably taken up Piranha Plant's spot. He was another character included in a similar vein for similar reasons. He has fun moveset potential and I think this is agreed upon by most fans who played Mario RPG and Sakurai alike, but there was no mention of him being rejected from the roster of Ultimate like he was for Smash 4 and Brawl, so he unfortunately may be done for good. But the point of this video is not just to examine why he got cut, but the ramifications for if he did get in. And oh boy, there would have been a lot with Brawl in particular. First of all, a Square character getting into Brawl would have not only shown the significant growth of Nintendo and Square Enix's relationship allowing for partnerships that we're seeing modernly to have happened much sooner, but someone like Cloud would have been a much more realistic of an implementation in a Smash 4 than he was. 
Disney's. And while Sora is Disney owned, the gateway through Square would kind of be open for more discussions at least. Absolutely, right? If you got into Brawl, I find it really difficult to find a direct replacement since there's really no retro Mario character added in and nobody who would play any similar vein to him, but for Smash 4's base game, maybe Rosalina? Although Nintendo was really trying to push her around this time, so who knows? It would have been nice to see Gino in one of these games regardless, but if he had to replace someone more interesting, I definitely would not be for it. This guy's an obscure character from some random SNES game. This is something that people need to recognize. And since we brought up Cloud, I'd be remiss not to mention that Cloud was not the only Final Fantasy representative considered to be included in Smash 4's DLC. Once it was seen that a deal with Square Enix could be done to get one of their Final Fantasy characters in a playable spot, the team began wondering who it should go to. And while some of the fanbase had thrown out names like Black Mage, who had been included in Mario Hoops 3 on 3 in the past and Mario Sports Mix, the only characters that Sakurai has mentioned in interviews pertaining to the topic are Tara Brantford, the protagonist of Final Fantasy 6, Strago Magnus, another playable character from the same entry, Bart's Claws are the protagonist of 5, and Fusoya, one of the playable characters in 4. An interesting variety here, each of which could have had their own unique playstyle and, more importantly to me, their own unique ripple effect. You see, when Cloud got in, the franchise listed next to him in his reveal was Final Fantasy 7, not simply Final Fantasy. And with 7 specifically being the focus here, we would end up getting Sephiroth as a playable character in the second Fighter's Pass for Smash Ultimate. And I think it's safe to say that if one of these four rejected characters actually got in, there would be no Sephiroth. At least not for right now. Let me explain. The reason why I believe this is if Terra took Cloud Spot, for instance, and that would have made a rep from Final Fantasy VI the franchise's sole representative, you're not gonna go add Sephiroth, the main villain of Final Fantasy VII, before adding Cloud first. This isn't a situation where that character is so much more unique and interesting that one just has to happen first. No, I mean, Sephiroth is unique and all, but Cloud still has the limit system which provides him more attacks to use. He's definitely not a skippable character, right? Especially when you consider the icon value and the fact that Terra and Sephiroth wouldn't really work well together. So it's pretty important for Sephiroth fans that Cloud got in here. And you know what? I'm gonna come out and say it. If Strago or Fusoya got in, we may not even have Cloud in Smash today. These two aren't the protagonists of their games. If there was a natural next step to go for a Final Fantasy rep after one of them got into Smash 4, it would have been the protagonist of 6 or 4 respectively, not 7 with Cloud. I'm not as adamant about this take as I am with the last one, but I'll definitely say that it would not be a fait accompli to have Cloud in for sure. The fact that 7 is a cult classic and was getting a remake definitely helps, don't get me wrong, but also don't forget in this hypothetical scenario, this is the same guy that got passed on for one of these guys from other entries. Cloud would have already been rejected here, so to say that he's an automatic would be like saying that if Ike was the first Fire Emblem rep, then Marth would be an automatic. I mean, sure it would make sense to add him in, as his original title was getting a remake on the DS around the time of Brawl's release, but would their arm really have been twisted enough to add him in over someone like the Black Knight from the same game? Doesn't that make more logical sense? Regardless, we have plenty of interesting scenarios here, although according to Sakurai, it was difficult to imagine a first Final Fantasy fantasy rep who wasn't Cloud, so he was really thought to be the obvious choice. You're not gonna start adding Mario reps with Luigi, right? You gotta go with what works best first, and they definitely went with the right choice here. Definitely gonna be interesting when we reveal the complete roster of every rejected fighter got in at the end of the video, and not having Cloud in there is gonna be quite a stark difference. Next is a rejected character who actually is in Smash. Sorta. So are we breaking the rules of this video? I'll leave that up to you. In the same way that Larry Koopa is playable in Smash Ultimate, Alf from Pikmin made his playable debut in Smash 4 as a palette swap for Olimar, but according to Sakurai, this was not the original plan. Alf was supposed to be his own character. The reasons for this were due to the desired reference the newer series release at the time, Pikmin 3, by including the new Rock Pikmin from there as part of Alf's moveset, sort of making him a semi-clone type character to Olimar. But the interviews that have been gathered surrounding the subject, it seems like Alf was very close to getting in, with Sakurai saying he was quote, next in line to become a clone. So why didn't it happen? Well this was likely due to a lack of development time, even though he was supposed to be a semi-clone, there was still a unique Pikmin concept that would needed to have been developed for this. And since him using Olimar's existing moveset is still pretty fitting, there likely wasn't too much pressure to put in the extra effort when those resources could have been better spent elsewhere. Probably on that board game mode that everyone totally played, right? And that lack of urgency is seemingly still persisted to this day, with Alf being nowhere to be seen amongst the plethora of Echo additions added to pad out Smash Ultimate's roster. But let's take things back for a second. If Alf got into Smash 4, would there have been any significant impact? Well, aside from having the Rock Pikmin in, you could potentially have allowed Olimar to keep his Brawl recovery in Smash 4 and give Alf the 
the winged Pikmin recovery instead. This is the one that they transitioned to Olimar to still provide some references to Pikmin 3, but this way you could provide some difference between the two, while distinguishing Alpha as the sort of modern Pikmin rep, allowing Olimar to remind us of the series past. But other than that, there really isn't too much that isn't nitpicky. Would it have been great to see Alpha as a semi-clone? Yeah, absolutely. But considering how good the roster ended up turning out with the decision to leave him in as an alt, you never know. Maybe spending more resources on him could have changed things for the worse overall. So hard to call out Nintendo out too hard on this one. I'd love to see him or some other Pikmin rep included in the future though. Maybe not as much as we'd like to see that Pikmin 4 release, but hey, at least it's something. And moving on to the final entry in the series, the final set of DLC characters. This is Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, and this may be the biggest set of all. Let's start with Alucard from Castlevania, who was rejected from the roster of Smash Ultimate in the place of Simon and Richter. Why? The reasons behind this I feel were mainly due to the increased desire for roster padding in the game. Simon was the original protagonist with Alucard appearing as a boss in Castlevania Dracula's Curse before eventually assuming the full on playable role in Symphony of the Night, arguably becoming the series most popular character modernly, meaning it would make sense in theory for Simon to be cast aside for someone who many would likely recognize more. But it didn't happen. Sakurai has stated in interviews in the past that Smash fans in his mind would prefer one of the Belmonts to Alucard, which could be conjecture or information he gleaned from the fighter ballot results and there's really no way of knowing for certain because they never ended up releasing these. Probably to hide the fact that Shrek and Goku were probably like top 5. <laughs> Combined with all this, the ability to add in Richter as an Echo fairly easily allowed for more references to be added in instead of just having one character, and he certainly got a point there. While Alucard could have certainly had an interesting moveset, Simon and Richter are already pretty unique in their own right playstyle wise, so I feel they could have made the wrong call here if the rejected character actually got into Smash. It's not like this is Alucard's last opportunity to get into Smash either. We could potentially see him in the future. I'm not saying he's the most likely pick or anything, but still has some semblance of a chance. I don't know if the same can be said for Decidueye though, definitely without a doubt one of the most viral omissions from Smash Ultimate if you want to consider any of them in that vein, as this one got a lot of buzz when Sakurai came out in an interview saying that for the Gen 7 Pokemon rep they wanted to have in the game, the decision came down between Decidueye and Incineroar. And the phrase, the grass is always greener may never have been used more appropriately here as the grass type Pokemon was seen by many as the better option of a fighter. But why was this? And more importantly, why was Incineroar chosen. While many fans prior to the reveal of Pokemon Trainer's return for Smash Ultimate, including myself, kind of wanted that fire, water, grass core with the three starters being Decidueye, Greninja, and Charizard in the roster of the game. Charizard was left on his own for Smash 4. We didn't know at the time that Squirtle and Ivysaur would be brought back. But with the duo coming back, this didn't really persist as much in the fan base, even though some still wanted it. Despite this, many believed that Decidueye's combination of grass and ghost type attacks both from longer range and up close could have led to a fun character. Yet despite this, he got passed on in favor of Incineroar who, to the uninitiated, would just seem like your standard prototypical fighting game type character that didn't have too much interesting to offer, which makes Sakurai's reasoning for including him that much more fascinating, as Incineroar was said to be included due to him having a quote, more unique moveset compared to Decidueye. Sure, Incineroar has uniqueness from many other characters in Smash, with the wrestling styled fighting attacks being different from someone like Ryu for example, but still not overly unique. This especially being combined with the fact that Incineroar doesn't even use any dark type moves, like come on, that's one of his two types and the only one that's not shared by any other fighter in Smash, are you kidding me? I don't know, maybe we as fans saw something more in Decidueye than Sakurai and the team did, but bottom line is he got cut. But the ripple effect for if he got in may not have been the best, as I feel if Decidueye got in, we would have been much more likely to get a Gen 8 Pokemon rep included as DLC, since Cinderace was one of the front runners here, and they likely didn't want to have three physical fire type Pokemon in Smash for moveset diversity's sake, so if Decidueye was included instead of Incineroar, we would have only had one physical fire type, leaving the option open for Cinderace. Despite this, I still think I would have preferred Decidueye and Smash instead of Incineroar though. Weighing the two options was close, but I'm gonna come out and say they made the wrong call here. And I brought up Hihachi earlier, and we're gonna return to him briefly once again. I brought up Kazi in the last segment for a reason, as according to Sakurai, Hihachi would be considered once again as the tech and fighter slot for this game before they eventually determined that Kazi having the devil gene would allow for better moveset potential compared to Hihachi. Once again, the move component of the character design is brought up, and considering that, I'm gonna say they made the right call in both instances here, in Smash 4 and in Ultimate. Without a doubt, including Pac-Man was a must that I absolutely support, and if they thought that Kazuya would be a lot more fun to play, then taking the less iconic character may have been for the better in the newer entry too. The devil mechanics were pretty interesting. And speaking of taking a less iconic character, this is kind of what happened when Min Min was introduced for Smash Ultimate, as she was chosen as opposed to one of the cover characters such as Spring Man or Ribbon Girl. But according to Sakurai, these guys weren't even considered to be in the game. This decision came down to Min Min or Ninjara. He would mention this in the June 2020 
Sakurai Presents video that introduced the character, and he said that Min Min was ultimately chosen due to the request of ARMS director Kosuke Ibuki, between those two that we were considering, meaning that Ninjara is a rejected character from Smash Ultimate's roster, and would we have been better off with him or without him? I've talked about Min Min a few times in videos recently, and I've learned that a lot more people are fans of the character than I thought, which is fine, you're entitled to your wrong opinion, I still don't believe that the fighter concept translates too well into a fun Smash move set though. This is likely due to the slow paced nature of the character with the long arm based attacks, and while Ninjara would definitely share that component, he would have definitely been faster with the use of his unique warping abilities for some added fun. And because of that solving one of the fundamental issues about the character for me, I think it's safe to say that choosing this guy would have at least had some more potential to be a decent character. He certainly wasn't as popular as Min Min was, but from a purely moveset potential perspective, I would have liked to have seen it. Now one of the most unique rejected characters in the history of Smash has to be Slime from Dragon Quest. Just look at this little guy man, are you trying to tell me that he was seriously considered for Smash? Well if you listen to Sakurai, this was no joke. We've talked at length about Square Enix properties in this video and how not everything in theory can just be given the green light when making a deal with them to get a new character added into the roster, and while Sakurai was asking them about the possibility of a Dragon Quest representative joining the battle for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate and awaiting approval, there were fears felt amongst the team that perhaps they wouldn't allow it to happen, instead maybe allowing for some other character from the series who wasn't the main playable representative of a game to be in Smash. And according to Sakurai, if this was the case, they had a backup plan. They would have quote, been perfectly fine adding in Slime as a character. Yeah. Now it is looking at this little guy on the surface, there doesn't seem to be too much to get excited about. But when you consider how many different appearances these characters have had and the tons and tons of different forms and abilities implemented onto them, there certainly could have been a very unique moveset here, kind of like the Goomba and Shy Guy character concepts I've talked about in previous videos. Comparing this to Bubbles from Cuckoo Land that I talked about earlier on in the video, Slime is a much more iconic character compared to him, and I would have much preferred to see this concept applied to Slime instead of Bubbles. But all of this didn't end up mattering since Square allowed the team to use the various heroes in a playable role. And despite my optimism for Slime to an extent, I still cannot say that they made the wrong call here. Considering if you want to talk character uniqueness, I mean Hero has that in spades compared to pretty much everyone else. You're not going to get much more unique than this guy, and Hero is definitely one of the best additions, so they undoubtedly made the right call. And one more rejected character that we got here is that at one point during Smash Ultimate's development, Rex was planned to fight alongside Pyra and Mithra in a similar vein to how both Ice Climbers fight together, but he ended up being removed due to technical issues with the implementation of the idea. As Sakurai claimed that getting both characters to move at the same time on the screen was quote, impossible to do. This meant that Rex ended up being relegated to a supporting character slot, appearing in Pyra and Mithra's uptaunt, final smash, and victory poses. And while this is unfortunate for Rex, it's definitely understandable, although I bet we can all agree that if this was possible in theory, it would have been a much more interesting character concept, effectively combining the swapping of Zelda and Sheik with a more intricate version of the Ice Climbers. Are you kidding me? It would have been just like the Dixie Kong concept that we talked about earlier on in the video, it would have been great and possibly the most unique fighter we've ever seen. If this combined concept didn't happen, it didn't seem too likely that Rex had a chance to get in on his own either. It never seems to have been the proposed idea, and even if it was, I think it's safe to say that a swapping character is much better than an individual one, because both Pyra and Mithra's movesets on their own are even on par in terms of uniqueness as compared to what we would have imagined Rex would have turned out to be. Pyra and Mithra are probably more iconic than Rex anyway for, uh, reasons. Hey, at least Rex probably wouldn't have had to have been censored, right? But this is the moment that we've waited for. We've gone through every single rejected fighter, talked at length about why each one of them was cut, and the ripple effect that we would have had in Smash had they actually gotten in. And here's how the roster would have turned out had every rejected fighter gotten in. I'm showing a couple different versions here due to some characters theoretically occupying the same slot as another one, as well as accounting for the guys like Gino, Takamaru, and Haihachi who had multiple chances to join the battle. Suffice to say, with the tally of my preferences throughout this video leaning heavily towards towards supporting the decisions that Nintendo made, they clearly know what they're doing. But despite that, there were still many times where they undoubtedly made the wrong call. And others where my opinion leans that way, but some may not feel similarly, and for that, I really encourage you to leave your thoughts about every one of these fighters in the comments down below, or at least the ones that you're passionate about. Many of these instances have got me riled up throughout this video because who knows, these moments of rejection could have very well been the last chance for each of these characters to get into the roster. Getting into Smash, as Fire Emblem has shown, can completely change the course of direction for your series. It can completely save your franchise, and that's why getting into Smash means so much, and why fans get so passionate about their favorite character joining the battle. This is what would have happened if every confirmed rejected character in Smash history actually got into the game, and if you want to see more content like this in the future, don't forget to subscribe.